I don't, I don't know if you prescribe that. If you can't pronounce what's written on the back of it, don't buy it. That is 100% something I teach all my clients. Right? So I, I get into the nitty gritty of how to read labels, but that's a basic principle that if anyone takes away one thing from this conversation and it's for their overall health, if you can't pronounce the ingredients on the back of the label, don't, don't buy it. You shouldn't be eating Fuck it. it. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, so my name is Manoli Lagos. My background is in the health and wellness space. I was previously out of college working for a big four company. I was working for PricewaterhouseCoopers. Fuck them. And uh, it was a good experience, honestly, four years with them. Um, but by the end, I was getting burnt out. I started having some health issues. Um, I also got sick in college and um, it kind of sparked my health journey in school. Um, to start cooking on my own, to get off the school meal plan, to start looking into my health. I saw a homeopathic doctor freshman year after getting tonsillitis uh, month after month. And that's kind of what interested me in nutrition and, and allowed me to kind of dive a little bit deeper into it. Mm -hmm. um, so then going after college, uh, working in the big four, I was just really working long hours, traveling a lot, and the stress of, of work and travel kind of caught up to me. And I, I hit a breaking point and um, I started getting sick a lot, even though I was relatively healthy, you know, working out four or five times a week, cooking my own food, eating pretty clean. Mm -hmm. I was still getting sick. So that's what really sparked my health journey. Um, and I decided to, while I was working, get a, a degree in nutrition. So I did that mm -hmm. through the Institute of Integrative Nutrition. Mm -hmm. um, I got my health coaching certificate while I was working. And then I just started coaching people because I found it was really a natural fit for me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's that's kind of sparked this whole journey for me. Mm -hmm. um, after a few months of coaching, I turned, you know, two clients into five, five turned into 10, 10 turned into 20. And then I decided to leave the full-time job. Mm -hmm. um, and I left the corporate world, took the jump. That was earlier this year. Um, and since then, I've had the pleasure of working with over 100 people. Mm -hmm. um, I've worked with businesses, I've worked with individuals, I've done group coaching, so I've kind of worked in a bunch of different settings. But uh, properly, uh, my my name is Manoli Lagos, and I'm a wellness consultant. Mm. That's, that's, that's really right, right. No, no, no. It's, um, I, think, I think it'll be almost an understatement to say that your graph over the last one year has been anything short of exponential. Because if you took this leap a year or so, or so ago, um, things have moved monumentally upwards for you. And that speaks to some degree for the credit that you have in terms of your wisdom and your application. But before we get into all of that, I want to pick on the fuck PWC comment. <laughs> <laughs> no, because it's, it's kind of personal to me. It is. Um, and I'm sure it is, a, it, it, it is in some sense personal to a lot of people. But before I put on the table as to why fuck PWC from my end, why fuck PWC from your end? Um, to be honest, the taste they put in my mouth at the end was just, it was just um, a, a project that I was on and I was just getting worked like a dog. Mm -hmm. I was traveling a lot and working weekends, working 16, 18 hour days. And I really didn't leave with any animosity. I was actually really thankful for the experience I had with them. Um, I learned a lot and I don't think I would be where I'm at if it wasn't for that experience. Cause during the process of working for a big company, I learned about um, all the areas that a company lacks in terms of employee health and wellness. So that actually mm -hmm. helped me think through my ideas, test my business plan. And I actually had the idea to do what I'm doing now while I was working at PwC. Mm -hmm. So I don't really have any animosity towards them, mm -hmm. but I do think, you know, there's, there was a lot of parts about working for a big company. Um, not only that you're a small number, but in terms of, of like the work and the output they expect from you. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, essentially the amount they don't really value your personal health right mm -hmm. so that that was just one of the things that i took away from working for these big companies so that's what made me really want to get in touch with consultants bankers the people that work long hours mm -hmm. and see how i can help them on a personal scale and see how i can help, help them on a larger scale from a mm -hmm. business consulting perspective right it's it's similar for me like on a personal level i carry no animosity mm -hmm. no but if i were to if I were to, and I do this thought experiment with myself where I imagine I'm an alien, right? And you, you heard of that. How will you explain this to somebody who's from Mars kind of thing? Yeah. And I try to explain myself or reverse engineer the process of working in a big four or one of these things. Yeah. I worked in the fifth, Grand Contern comes fifth in that line. It's an Australian company. I worked for the India department for like a couple of months. And I mean, my, my, my animosity is more with the job that I was doing than the company that I was in. But as far as the architecture of the company goes, um, I, for me, it wasn't just that they did not value my personal health, but they did not value my person. 
and that's where the full stop happens yeah. in that sense because um and i think that's that's just a deficit of working with any organization that is way bigger than you are you yeah. are reduced to a cog in the wheel and yeah. and that is something i don't personally fuck with right um but it i met somebody very recently uh, another entrepreneur as a matter of fact uh, and another entrepreneur in the fitness industry as a matter mm-hmm. of fact you probably would get along with him um and he used to work for a big ass huge ass bank was making a bunch of fucking money and then one day this guy is just like listen i cannot continue doing this like there, there is a spirit inside of me that does not let me rest within the confines of this place at all and um he took the leap and he started his own company and he's been working on that since and he had he, he had a similar complaint it's not that it's a complaint of structure it's a complaint of fit mm-hmm. it doesn't fit me yeah right and i'm sure that happens i mean nutritionally speaking dude that's all there is right i i think the index of nutrition is not what is good or bad but what fits you better but it happens a lot i'm sure with the current stuff you do do in terms of workouts in terms of you know psychological well being that there is a particular thing that's just efficient with your systems mm-hmm. and that is what needs to be guarded that is what needs to be watered for totally. it to blossom totally do you agree with that 100% so i cannot imagine making that leap being easy and i want you to tap into yourself go a little deeper find maybe um the exact dialogue that was happening in your head when you because this is a daring choice yeah it's disintegrating on a personal level am i no longer going to be this person who's earning this much money and i'm going to start from scratch totally right like totally. what was the dialogue in your head like totally it was it was a lot of it was self fear right i was i was afraid for what would come next from a financial perspective from what other people would think of me perspective you mm-hmm. know So I really had to make the choice um but as I started getting into the nutrition program I started working with people and I started creating a methodology and then I realized that that methodology didn't align with the life I was living. I felt like I was I had two paths that were straying from each other mm. and I felt like I wasn't being true to myself. Mm. And once I kind of had that epiphany that I was living almost two separate lives telling people to do one thing and then actually living another way I realized that I really needed to just connect the two paths and and just start um almost on a completely fresh note mm. and that's what really pushed me but it was definitely scary um but I'm a huge believer that if you're not doing something you're passionate about and you really care about what you do on a day-to-day basis it's going to be really hard for you to be successful mm. and I mean really successful mm. um so that's that's what pushed me into taking the leap mm. so many hurdles um but I was confident from the get go that I had the the drive mm-hmm. and the willpower to kind of propel the business um but it was definitely scary I mean living in New York City your expenses are high right um I was making a good salary as a consultant mm-hmm. you know I was just mm-hmm. promoted to senior associate so I had wow. I had a lot going for me in the right. company but right. I just knew the answer wasn't climbing the ladder for the next 20 years to be partner right. and I knew that wasn't the life I wanted to live mm-hmm. um and and that was pretty apparent for me from the beginning um because you know I saw partners on my teams who were making great money but at the same time they were traveling Monday to Thursday and they weren't with their kids on those nights I knew that was something that I valued a lot was mm. being with the family and I I didn't want to be apart from my kids when right. I was you know a, a grown man with with you know responsibilities with responsibilities, for responsibilities. so mm-hmm. so that was a huge deciding factor and I think that kind of came from uh, all the good influence I've I've had in my life my dad's been a great mentor to me I've had a lot of uncles um who are entrepreneurs and they have their own businesses uh so it's kind of seeing that ideology from a young kid and knowing that's what I wanted to achieve um was really the driving factor in me taking the leap cuz I knew it was a matter of of when hmm. not not if. if right so that that was it for me there are two particular notes i have on on what you said um and feel free to comment feel free to because i have one very interesting question to ask you after um in fact two interesting questions two notes to two questions um if i fall on the psychological well-being side of things at least on 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 some empirical anecdotal level that's all i've been researching without knowing that that's what i've been thinking about right and recently i got i got to take a class with a leader in in psychological well-being and so on it's called the, the class is called the science of living well i don't know if eden's mentioned it to you she's in the same class as i am and and this is an industry leader in that field and we were talking about um notions of humanistic psychology and 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 such and one of the essential or one of the the citadel on which humanistic psychology is based or good psychological well-being in the humanistic tradition is based is the integration of self mm-hmm. and this is something i observe with so many of my friends and i mean i'm i'm purposely calling them out so they're aware that this is a phenomenon what where what they do is there is two obviously distinct personalities that they exhibit 
right mm-hmm. psychoanalysis in general would tell you that there are many personalities that live within you and they come out from time to yeah. time but there's two different things that they're saying and there is no effort to reconcile the two things because there is a risk there there's a fear associated with the sure. reconciliation yeah. and uh when that happens for long enough and you cannot episodically trace back the moment of that divergence what happens is you become split and the shore is too far and you don't know if you keep swimming you will get to the other shore or not you don't know if it's a river or an ocean you never find out and it becomes a very helpless situation you you start not trusting yourself and that's one of the worst positions you can be on a psychological well-being scale is not being able to trust the word that you have for yourself yeah on the other end why stuff like um senior associate or so on is naively funny to me and i mean that naively because um it it sparks of a little immaturity or it sparks of a little rebellion against the global games that sure. we play sure uh I had a friend recently and he was talking to me about this new job and he's like yeah it's going to be fun I was like dude how's it going to be fun you're going to be crunching numbers and he's like uh but I get to take out my my, my clients on a breakfast once in a while and I was like <laughs> you like for real man like if you think of it from an essentially biological human like tabula rasa mode that's it's it's such a silly thing that we like totally. new terms and occasional excursions to the breakfast deli for and we justify the the mundanity of corporate jobs in that sure. sense right and th- this is this is not an attempt to call somebody out this is just a personal reflection on the phenomena but my question to you is this very often with a leap like that what people fear the most is a downgradation if not an annihilation of their lifestyle they feel like they're they're going to have to downgrade their lifestyles initially mm-hmm. did that happen with you yeah i did i mean immediately right the finances hit so i before i took the leap i made sure i had my budget set i i knew how much i had to save to kind of start the business and do everything that i wanted to do luckily i didn't have many overhead costs cuz my coaching business in the beginning was all done remotely mm-hmm. um now i have this beautiful office space um so that that's part of the overhead but yeah the, there was definitely a a thought process that immediately kind of constricted me mm-hmm. and it made me just really want to hunker down and do my work versus doing all the things that I was doing um when I had the nice cushy salary in New York City mm-hmm. um so I think in the first couple of months there was some restriction um but I I really learned to kind of deal with that and make the most of it um and then I learned to kind of spin it around and turn it into um you know concise indulgence mm-hmm. um so I think I've really come to balance it and and since I've seen so much success with my clients mm. um and the business in the past couple of months it's really it's really changed the way that I look at things mm-hmm. and um I would say that that definitely was a big feeling that I had in the beginning mm. Mm. because that's it's it, this was more of a personal reflection I have on 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 the state of affairs for myself you know like I realize on some level one of my biggest I I come from a well off uh family you know my my parents have done very well for themselves and to start off on an entrepreneurial venture especially of this gaseous nature where yeah. you know it's a hit or miss in so many senses yeah. um it always worries me if and i know a lot of people who who follow a trajectory very similar who who fuel their entrepreneurial sides similarly um they have a question as to how they would how is it going to feel once my lifestyle is at least initially downgraded yeah and y- you seem to suggest that it just changed the way you see things it wasn't really a pain or a pleasure of downgrading it was just a new way of looking at life yeah there definitely were pains associated with it there'd be nights where i'd have like a knot in my stomach and i'd be thinking about you know the bonus i could have gotten mm. or this steady paycheck right it's it's uh you have a, a new set of stressors that are put on you once you become your own boss and it's it's really scary it takes a lot of self motivation Um I remember trying different modalities listening to Tim Ferriss's 4-hour work week. He's got a great book on being productive and kind of being your own boss and managing your time. So I remember blocking my time out day to day. Um and when you're working from home, right? You have so many distractions. You can get caught up doing your laundry. Um and that can, you know, blow half your day mm-hmm. or um uh, you know, all these things come up when you're working at home. You don't have that structured workspace that I was used to. Mm-hmm. Um so I kind of had to figure out and re-engineer how to structure my day from you know when i wanted to check my emails to what i wanted to set my goals for the week mm-hmm. um so i i started prioritizing responsibilities and i think i just became more responsible in general mm-hmm. uh for my time um and i learned to not really despise the work i was doing i think that was the biggest change in my mind was um instead of getting an email at 11 from my boss 
and being like, oh, now I have to do this, right? Mm -hmm. Now I have to make this stupid change to this, this slide. That's not gonna mean anything in two weeks. Right. Um, I found myself, you know, waking up early on Saturdays, waking up early on Sunday, and just eager to learn, eager mm -hmm. to read, eager to start building my business plan out. Um, and not that I really think anyone should just take the leap without thinking it through, because I definitely thought it through, mm -hmm. and I definitely had a business plan um, but I wouldn't have had all the ideas that I have now if I didn't actually just jump in and start getting experience in the space that I was interested in, which is mm -hmm. the wellness space. Um, but I also had clients too, and I had some cash flow coming in before I left PwC. Mm -hmm. So I made sure that I at least was paying my baseline expenses, right? right. So I wasn't going to be digging into my savings and that type of thing. So that's definitely something I advise everyone to think through before they leave potentially leave their big uh, corporate job or just their steady paying job to start their own businesses, think through your business plan, have some income already coming your way. So that way you can at least pay off your rent or your baseline living expenses. Yeah. Um, and then and then really uh, just let it all go from there. And don't be afraid once you feel like you have that. Don't wait for the moment to be right because there is no exact right moment. Mm. Um, just just do it when it feels right. And how's about, how's about say it did not work out? Right? Worst case scenario, let me curse you. Say tomorrow you wake up and all your clients are gone. What do you do then? How about that fear? It's it's a real fear. And you know, it's like, you know, I've only been doing this for a year and a half now, um, two years at most. So there is a still still a chance of failure, but I think the key is that I now know this is the space that I want to play in. I've seen mm. so many other opportunities in this space that I wouldn't have seen before if I didn't jump into it and take right. that leap. So now I'm, there's no fear of failure for me anymore mm -hmm. uh, because I know there's so many avenues I can take this uh, this passion, this career, uh, being in the wellness space. So that's that's a really legitimate question is what if, what right. if failure, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't have seen all of these other avenues. You know, I, I started off just doing private coaching. Now I'm doing corporate wellness consulting. Now I'm doing other things that I didn't imagine I'd be doing. Um, so there's, there's revenue streams that come um, just through experience and through kind of immersing yourself in, in the knowledge. So, right, yeah. right. It's, um, it's you, you, you're bang on, man. It's like, unless you open the door, the possibility of adaptation does not come to you, yeah. right? It's only when you open the door, like, and th this is something I've experienced. I sat back and I sat back and I stayed there and I was like, I'm going to think it through. But it wasn't until I opened the door, walked through, and I was like, listen, let's do it. And then if I fail at it, let's adapt from that. You cannot do it from behind the door. You totally. have to cross over. Totally. Right? But then I'm always very interested in the corporate phenomenon because I'm such a cynic uh, in general. What does corporate wellness mean? Like, what what is happening there? What are they trying to do? So right now, there's a really big trend in, in corporations investing in their employee well-being. So doing things like... Um, offering discounted gym memberships, catering healthy food, offering um, you know services that they pay for, where you can call a nurse practitioner and have them give you advice on on stress management techniques, hmm. um, on diet, on nutrition. So that's what the top, the best leading employers are doing right now. Um, PwC at the time didn't really have a strong system for it. They had well-being benefits, which was essentially you would get points for every time you did a well-being um, checklist item. And then you could save your points, you could turn those into a gift card. That was one thing they had. They had nurse practitioners that you could call and they would help you on like, if you had a chronic illness like diabetes hmm. um, or anxiety or depression, they would help talk you through that. Um, but they really didn't have anything that was very custom and very um, personalized and that's really what sparked my interest was like hey you know there's there's all these people that are traveling right that are working long hours that are traveling week to week and I was like why isn't there a department that I can call that can help me align my goals to my to my next six month travel schedule say mm -hmm. I'm going to be in Chicago for six months working um, why isn't there someone I can speak to at PwC that can help me create a, a customized fitness and nutrition plan so that way when I'm on the road I can start seeing progress in my health journey instead of mm. regressing. And that's what I saw myself doing was regressing, gaining weight, having more health issues. And I was like, how do we reverse this system mm. and create a way for people to actually advance in their health journey while working these long hours and while you know traveling every week? So what I'm getting at, or at least what I'm getting from you uh, with respect to all of this is that you created this custom fit health plan for extremely busy individuals yeah right like and that is a that is a territory 
unexplored because what extremely busy individuals tend to do usually is what you said it's one step forward two step back because the, totally. the time takes a toll and totally. and then the stress is just not good for your overall functioning after a peak point 100%. right like all of that but tell me um with this customized you know uh, multi fit plan that you sort of created i'm sure it is harder to attack the enemy on all fronts so you probably have a base that you start from and then start you know so is that is that base stress given how the corporate culture is so stress filled or is that base nutrition which is usually what you know well being coaches and all of those people start with yeah so so now i have a structured system that i didn't have before mm -hmm. and before it was just attacking kind of all the areas that i felt were important and really back then for me i thought health just meant fitness and food right mm -hmm. but now i look at it as a i look for, at it from a stress perspective from a um, sleep perspective i look at it from a supplementation perspective from a relationships perspective from a career perspective so i have all these pillars that we can talk about a little bit later and we can, mm. i can walk you through all the main pillars mm. um, but at the time i really just found a way to maximize my diet and my exercise for the time i was given because there would be days where i'd only have 15 minutes to work out and i didn't have time to make it to the hotel gym mm. so i would just devise a system i'd start traveling with jump ropes resistance bands doing workouts in my rooms mm. um, i started finding ways to maximize my sleep and following um, some of these big biohackers like dave asprey he has a, a cool little video on youtube that shows you how to optimize your hotel room for better sleep mm. um, and things like that really started to trigger my in interest I started helping people that I was working with. I started creating kind of a system that I would follow week in and week out. And and once I did that, it was just kind of it felt right, it felt natural. I found myself helping people, and that's kind of what's been the foundation of the system that I help people with now. Hmm. And I would say a lot of my clients are bankers, consultants, people who work long hours. I work with a lot of college students too. I do have a range of people that I work with from, you know, young high school students, athletes, Olympic athletes, to you know older married couples so the range is pretty broad but um that's that's my specialty that's where i started and that's mm -hmm. kind of what um sparked this whole journey right yeah right so now these pillars are they weighed equally in your system or do you cuz here, here, here's here's where i'm coming from the way i see um the well being that and you know my plans for well being i start very simply with listen i have to make sure i'm exercising 45 minutes a day at least or 30 minutes if, if that's the only time i have i make sure that's at least how much i'm meditating a day mm -hmm. and those form the basics then the third basic is nutritionally i remove sugar dairy and gluten which is at least the minimum i can remove Great. and then i follow from there see if i have to adapt very frankly it has worked in the regressive part for me i used to be a lot bigger a lot healthier a lot fitter in every sense of the word um i have just been more lazy and so my system is obviously in defect i need to start turning the wheels faster mm -hmm. for myself if you were to conceptualize this system and arrange it in in some fashion or probably it fits with the way you arrange it these are the same elements how do you how would you go about doing that so in terms of weighting the different pillars of wellness um i mean i definitely would put diet and sleep up there as being the two most important because without good sleep you're going to be chronically stressed you're not going to recover properly you're not mm -hmm. going to have energy you're going to have a lot of digestive issues and without eating the right foods I mean, you know, you're not going to optimize anything that your body is trying to do on a daily basis. So, you can't be eating a junk food diet and working out 7 days a week, getting perfect sleep, having great relationships, you know. I don't think you're going to be a healthy person if you're eating, you know, eating fast food all the For time. For sure. For so, sure. I do think there is an importance on on those two elements. Um movement too is what I kind of classify exercise into mm. that bucket of more just general movement. Mm. Um so yeah I mean if you want we can we can go through and yeah, I want to go through the movement aspect of it. What do you mean? Why do you classify it as a general movement? So I mean people think of exercises, right? Just going to the gym, lifting weights, going on the treadmill, running 3 miles. I don't think that exercise is is the key to health. I think movement is. Hmm. Um so most people um despise going to the gym. Hmm. Um and what I do with my clients is I help them kind of create a healthy mindset around exercise hmm. and I I really encourage them to find the type of movement that they enjoy the most if it's walking on the beach if it's going for a 5 mile run if it's yoga if it's um playing basketball i i encourage them to focus on the things they enjoy and that get their body moving mm. and then i help them tie in specific things to help them reach their goals mm. um so so i really believe it's first about 
finding what works for you, what works for your schedule. So for me, um, you know, I loved working out in the gym, but when I was consulting, I didn't have an hour to work out every day. So I had to make it work. So I had to come up with these concise, um, you know, hit workouts that I do in my hotel room. Um, I'd even run the stairs up and down the hotels I was staying at. So I just got really creative with it. And that's what I help my clients with now mm. is help them find a system that they enjoy doing. Cause I don't want it to be a chore. If it's a chore, it's not something you're going to sustain. sustain. Yep. And, and I don't really believe in doing anything that's not sustainable for the next 20, 30, 40 years. Mm. If it's something you're only going to do for a month, why even do it at all? Mm. Um, mm. So that's, that's kind of my, beliefs on movement mm -hmm. and then and then when i tie in some other beliefs there's this principle called the said principle mm -hmm. it stands for specific adaptations to impose demands mm -hmm. and what it really means is that if you're not switching up what you're doing your body will plateau right mm -hmm. so our body is uh, is an evolutionary machine if you were to start running 20 miles every day in the next five years your body would completely change shape right you'd lose all the excess fat you'd start to shed muscle that your body didn't want to carry when you're running mm. so you'd become this running machine so our body will adapt to whatever stress mm. that we impose on it so if you if you're doing the same workout routine every week for two years you know your body's eventually going to hit a plateau mm. so that's something i help my clients work through too is constantly changing up their routine so they're shocking their body shocking their muscles and they're constantly seeing progress is there a base routine though is there do you have like a you know you must at least start with the stretch or a warm-up yeah, or, yeah. There, there's some foundational movements i think depending on your goals there's a couple of movements um that i really recommend everyone do um, and then from there, it's customizing it to your goals. Right. Um, but I, I think, you know, starting off with some of the, the movements that promote longevity. So everything I do f for myself and with my clients is tailored towards longevity, right? So you must be a fan of Peter Atiyah big time then. Huge. Yeah. Right? Like, like what a fucking Atiyah. guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, he's awesome. I follow all his stuff. Um, he gets a little too technical for me sometimes. I mean, I'm just not as worse, but yeah. um, three hours three hours on, on epidemiology is just for me like, uh, okay, I need to get into <laughs> yeah. it. Because he, dude, it's just a whole different field. I haven't even moved the pieces around with, so I have no idea, you know? But um, it's interesting how he got into longevity and so on. Um, yeah. But what are these basic longevity movements that you tell everybody to incorporate? Yeah, so I think it's a combination of, of flexibility and strength. So resistance training is is when you're lifting weights when you're doing something that puts extra resistance on your body sure and i think that is one of the keys to longevity because it maintains bone density as we get older our bones become thinner and weaker mm. um, so i think having some sort of strength routine in your weekly practice daily practice is really important i don't think that's something you need to do every day but two times a week um, get some full body um, olympic style lifts some deadlifts, some some squatting, mm. um, bench press, and yeah, so on. bench press, shoulder press. I think that's really important for everyone just to maintain muscle integrity mm. and just to keep bone density um, positive throughout your life. So I think that that's a really big part of it. Um, but not to overdo that and to also couple that with flexibility, I think is really important yeah. too. Because the last thing you want to do is build a physique that's really it looks really good but, but you're so nothing. tight that you 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 know you pull your hamstring when you're tying your shoelace that's the last thing you really want right so i think doing exercises that build strength through length uh -huh. and help you become more flexible and building like functional strength is really i think the thing that people lack the most in their routines uh -huh. and that's really what i preach the most is functional strength functional muscle you don't want to just look good but you want to feel good you want to perform sure. good you want to be more athletic right um so that's kind of the, the modalities that I incorporate into the workout programs and all the things that I kind of preach with my clients. A lot of a major catalyst in the in the in the my regression, at least in terms of the body shape and structure that I have now. I mean, I'm in I'm in the worst shape in five years. I just more muscle, usually more muscle and a little less fat. But it's because I went to and I was referring about uh, referring to Ito Patal the last time we were hanging out. Um, I went to his um, his class and day one. I'm the biggest dude in the entire thing. Yeah. And I cannot do some of the most basic movements. And I realize my pelvis is tighter than a fucking asshole. Yeah. I cannot move my pelvis around. I cannot stay on in low gait. And from there, I just got super interested in working weird shit with my body. Yeah. How can I make this fucking better? How can I open it up so it can do like these graceful, dancey movements, which are very like fitness oriented. And so it's Ido Pratal, what he, I think, essentially did, he was a capoeira practitioner. I don't know if you looked him up after I mentioned. I did, yeah. yeah? I love his stuff. I've Dude, seen him before. it's fucking crazy. Yeah. He, he started off doing capoeira. He was like, listen, these guys are not comprehensive enough about movement. Yeah. So he goes to yoga. He goes, he travels the world, learns about it, and then condenses this very solid program. And then he builds an exclusive tribe around it. 
from an entrepreneurial perspective, from a philosophical perspective, and just from the scientific perspective of health and wellness, this guy created everything. Yeah. This movement culture, they don't believe in any sort of additions to your body at all. Like, um, either is a Puritan in that sense. He's like, you don't need no orthopedics. You don't need that. You'll figure it out. Work your body in a way that it gets to that shape. Yeah. So for somebody like me who has functionally flat feet, he's like, make your body adapt. And this guy is... Um, some of the stuff that I see on his Instagram or his his uh, his his uh, one of his first ment mentees was this guy named Roy Goldstein. You should yeah. definitely follow him. That's like a circus on your Instagram screen. The kind of stuff he does, it is it's inspirational. That's what your body's capable of. The first time I was watching Edo in, in, in this documentary, he's like, "Listen, you should be able to sit in a dead squat for thirty minutes," and it blew my fucking mind. Can you imagine just sitting like that with my fucking pelvis starts to feel like it's going to kill me? It's going to bottom up, annihilate my fuck, you know? After like, two minutes. Two minutes, yeah. yeah. And then he's like, likewise with dead hangs. You have monkey shoulders, don't forget that. You should be able to hang like a monkey. And so now when I go to the gym, the first five minutes is just this. And with that, what is happening is I'm slowly, I can feel it open my fucking muscles up all the way down to my to my hips. Yeah. Because it's slowly just pulling totally. them apart. He says, your postural issues will get fixed. If you just, and I observed my lower back, which is usually been tight because of my flat feet, totally. slowly start to open up. Yeah. So there is, there is so much consequential benefit from proper movement that I found with these guys that I was like, I'm willing to sacrifice some yeah. mus musculature on me yeah. for the sake of getting better, a better understanding of my body. Because totally. flexibility um, uh, or, or stability was no concept for a regular person who goes to the gym, at least from the land I belong to, fitness is this very limited conception of how would your guns look yeah. and how would your show muscles look. Sure. So chicken legs is a very prominent phenomenon totally, in gym goes, totally. right? They don't give a shit if the and legs is mostly where all your strength is core and legs is right? Yeah. Nobody realizes. Yeah. The first time I got hold of the idea that nutrition can be used for something more than just what my body looks like blew my fucking yeah. mind. Yeah. I remember it precisely the day I got on ketosis. The day ketosis hit me, four, four and a half days, the first day I was in ketosis, it just felt like I was dying. Yeah. It just felt... It, Keto I mean, flu. Yeah, the sickness, but also just like the lack of energy because the glycogen reserves are just being pulled. And then the keto flu. And then I remember the exact moment, dude. I cycled for two hours. I got my friend cycle. I was like, I need to climb a building naked right now. <laughs> like, I am so pumped. And it feels like you're, you're a maniac. I The only reason I survive a place like Colombia... I mean, at least in the beginning where I was just overwhelmed by the kind of stuff that was happening around me was because I was operating on 120%. I was meeting them more than halfway through. Yeah. I was going in strong. Yeah. And part of the reason was ketosis. But this should be an interesting segue into one of the most hotly contested issues on in, in nutritional science right now, which is this high, high fat, low carb and yeah. this high carb, low fat. And the other variant of it is kind of like the ketosis yeah. versus the veganism um, kind of a debate. And I want to get your take on that. And I mean, I understand it's such a hard debate to settle in any case. There is so much evidence and so much fucking funding into this evidence that it's hard to trace totally, you know, the, totally. the necktie to its extreme. But let's start. Let's see what we come out with that, right? What What is your general suggestion? Be, or here, here's a better question. What do you follow? So, so diet, nutrition is definitely one of the big pillars. I would say I'd put that up there with movement and sleep as the top most important thing. I think when people come to me, the first thing I try to educate them on is that there's no one size all fits diet. Um, and what's going to work for you won't necessarily work for me. So I think the first important thing is to understand that um, your body is bio individual, right? This concept of bio individuality, which mm. just, just says exactly what I just said before that what works for you might not necessarily work for me. And that's based on a lot of different things. That's based on our blood types. So mm. our blood types dictate what type of digestive enzymes that we have in our body. So blood types O, which I am, digest meat very easily compared mm -hmm. to blood types A, which do better on a vegetarian diet with maybe some some fish and a little bit of white meat. Mm -hmm. um, Bs can kind of do a little bit of both um, and they, they like legumes in their diet typically. So each blood type has a different digestive enzyme mix and different digestive system almost. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one way to slice it up. Another way is ancestry, right? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, someone that has ancestry from, let's say, the Caribbean versus someone who has Eastern, Korean, Asian, exactly. yeah, whatever you want to, those are going to be two different bodies, two different digestive systems. They're going to have um, specific enzymes in each of their tracts. How about the microbiome? Does the, is this the microbiome argument, essentially? This, this is both. This uh -huh. is both. So 
um, you know, it's really hard for me to tell those two people from two different parts of the world to eat the same things because their bodies are going to be genetically programmed to digest different foods from the get go. Hmm. So that has to do with their gut. That has to do with uh, the enzymes in their gut. So a lot of that is, is something that I try to educate people on. And then also, what's your lifestyle like? What are your goals? And like that is what I use to kind of make custom recommendations to my clients is, mm. is a combination of all of those factors. I don't think what works for you is going to work for me. I personally believe that a high fat diet is good uh, for most people. Um, there's a lot of exceptions to this. Um, and I do believe keto is a really powerful tool. It helps diabetics manage their weight, oh manage gosh, their blood sugar. I've that. seen people lose weight. I've seen people change their lives with keto. I don't think it's really a long-term sustainable solution though. It really isn't. Because you're eating, so what keto is for the people who don't know is when you're eating a diet that comprises of 80% of your calories come from fat, about 10% come from protein, and about 10% come from carbohydrates and sugars. Mm. Um, so doing that really means you have to put a huge emphasis on on getting healthy fats in your diet. And the biggest mistake I see people is that they do what's called dirty ketos yep. when they get all of their fat from things like dairy, like cheese, um, when they get it from processed foods that have these big keto labels. Uh, they have, they, yeah, exactly. And they have a bunch of like really processed, unhealthy inflammatory ingredients in them. So that's the biggest mistake is I see dirty keto. And the other challenge I see with it is that it's just hard to do it on the long term. Um, because, you know, it's it's really hard to make a keto meal and like to get that in a restaurant is going to be difficult. Um, the error rate is very low, right? You you make one mistake and you're out of ketosis. Exactly. And the 20 day hard work you have needs to start again to get you back into ketosis. Exactly. So I think a cyclical ketogenic diet, which is what I follow and a lot of my clients follow, is is really an easy way to do it. And it's much more sustainable. You're not counting your you're not counting your calories. You're not. Uh, micromanaging every meal to make sure it's 80% fat. So mm. you're in and out of ketosis many times throughout the day, throughout the week, um, and you're maximizing those moments when you are in ketosis and mm. you're doing things that help you double down on your fat burning. Mm. And, and that's really what I help my clients focus on is maximizing those moments mm. um, and then finding the diet that works for them based on their goals. Um, so, you know, for athletes, they're going to want a higher protein intake than, than the average person who's working out two or three times a week. Mm. Um, so a ketogenic diet may not fit for them. So I think mm. that's really important to take into account when we're looking at keto or we're looking at plant-based versus a meat diet, um, you know, is, is what are your goals mm -hmm. and what does your lifestyle look like? What does cyclical keto look like exactly? So cyclical keto is essentially you're eating a majority of your calories come from fat, so mm. 60%, mm. and then about 20, 25% from protein and about 15% from carbs. So you're, you're a high fat, low diet mm. with moderate protein, mm. and, and you're constantly trying to make every meal that you eat fit that spectrum. Mm. Um, so that way, when you wake up in the morning, you're in ketosis. If you fast until the afternoon, Ooh. you're also staying in ketosis. And if your first meal is a high fat meal, which you can do, and then you can Just save your exit. carbs for later in the day, right. then you're actually staying ketosis till you have any carbs. So there's ah. a lot of hacks that, um, you know, I built into the system that I work with my clients on. Like MCT oils and stuff? MCT is, is a great hack. DHB. Yeah, right? that's like great. Exogenous ketones. The exogenous ketones sometimes give me a headache, man. Yeah, so I've, I've had my ups and downs. I've tried a few different products. Um, I think they can be a good tool, but I don't think they're a complete shortcut. Oh, a yeah. lot of people think, hey, I can just eat donuts and have exogenous ketones. My, oh my body's going to go right into ketosis. No, it's going to fuck you up in two different ways. Yeah, right? so it's just going to send mixed signals to your body, mm -hmm. right? You, you, that's the last thing we really want to do. So I believe in doing it naturally and using those as a supplement in some situations. Mm -hmm. um, but I really believe in just doing it through through food. And it's really not that hard to do the cyclical version, which I've been doing for probably four years now. So I don't, I don't ever measure my... Ketone levels. ketone levels i don't i don't be on a stick the, bro go be on yeah, a stick i don't i don't <laughs> test myself on the millimolars the test you days. have to admit though the keto crowd gets a little annoying yeah you know they get just, a little just like the vegan crowd it becomes oh, like a, for sure. a, a religious thing um and I, I love both sides of of the spectrum i really believe in both right and i think it can be a great um a great tool for people to lose weight quickly and just to start feeling better right um but i really ease my clients into it mm -hmm. and i don't i don't suggest they just jump right into it because that shocks your metabolism and that causes what you felt, like you said, the keto flu. Oh, for sure. Which is, um, you know, it feels like you, 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 I had you pimples, feel like bro. Yeah. I never had pimples before. You feel like you're bedridden. And so the science behind that is your body was used to probably using. So our body runs on three sources of fuel, right? So the first can be fat, which if we're looking at the 
um, analogy of a car, right? So fat would be like the diesel fuel. Mm. So it's a slow burning fuel that our body can run on. And protein, think about protein as the infrastructure that builds the car. So that's what builds our muscles and our tissues. Mm. And think of carbs as the jet fuel. They're mm. like quick sources of fuel, right? It goes right in and out of you and it powers you, but it's, it's burned really quickly. Um, so I think the key that people don't really realize is that when we're constantly running on all three sources of fuel, fats, carbs, and protein equally, and we're not really choosing one, it sends mixed signals to our metabolism. Mm. And that's what's called metabolic gridlock. And that's when your metabolism doesn't really know what to do. And that's what causes kind of chronic, chronic stress on your body. So I think people um, that benefit so much from high protein diet, high fat diet, high carb diet is because they're not sending those mixed signals to their body mm -hmm. and they're just choosing one fuel source. Mm -hmm. So I think if that's one takeaway is that anytime you, you stick with one fuel source, it's gonna help your body um, kind of know what to expect and your metabolism will kind of just regulate itself more naturally. Right. But that being said, what works for you right now might not work for you in six months. I think mm. that's one of the most powerful things that we all have to learn as well, is that I found this awesome diet that worked for me, right? I started fasting, I started doing keto, I got my body fat down to 8%, I was feeling lean and great, um, but then I noticed I plateaued six months later. So your body eventually will adapt to that, right? Mm. Going back to that said principle that I mentioned earlier, and I think it's really important for people to know that what works for you now might not work for you in a year. So you have to be always willing to change and kind of like listen to your body. Mm. I think that's a key point that people overlook. So here is a concern I have. So, I mean, I want to talk about intermittent fasting too, but my uh, my routine goes something like this. I eat, I mean, dude, I'm I'm, I'm going to shame myself here, but I, I, I finish eating at 10, 11. I go okay. to sleep around 12, 1, right? I wake up and I do not eat anything up until 8, 9 again. And then my eating window is between 8 p.m. and 10, 10, 30, 11 p.m. That's okay. right. So like I, I have a very massive fasting window, wow. but it does not get me at least the physical benefit of uh, fasting. Like I don't lose fat. And that probably is because I'm eating too close to my sleeping hours. 100%. Right. That could be it because I think it's a 21 hours is a, is a dope ass fasting window. But I'm okay. always confused. Um, and tell me what you think about it. I'm always confused. I it, And this might help with the cyclical keto thing too. Do you think I should eat carbs right before I go to work out? Say in cyclical keto or in my, in my dietary uh, profile? Or should I eat it right after? I think right after. And the reason is because when you, when you work out, your body burns through your glycogen, which is your sugar stores. Mm. And it needs a quick replacement. So the best time, in my opinion, to have those carbs would be right after the workout. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. that, that's a really common question I get, but it all kind of depends on to your schedule. What does your day to day look like? So that's that's one thing that I like to customize with the people that I recommend. So the fast that works for me, it might not work for you, but I definitely would recommend that you get that feeding window instead of making it from like eight to 10 at night, get it to get it to like early afternoon. So that way you're digested, you know, you have five to six hours of an empty stomach before bed. Mm. And that's just going to allow you to get better quality sleep. So yeah, man. If, if you go to bed with a full stomach, your body is not going to worry about um, recovering and detoxing. It's going to worry about digesting that food. That's mm. the most important thing. It's, it's, it's number one it task, right? It hurts me knowing that. So it's going to spend a lot of its energy in the first couple hours of your sleep digesting food instead of, instead of say, maybe getting you that deep sleep you needed, instead of getting you into the REM or instead of, you know, preparing telling you to feel more well rested the next day. Mm. So it's not necessarily going to ruin your sleep, but it might impact the quality of it. So that's why I really mm. urge people to eat at least three hours before bedtime, then cut it off after that. For sure. I think that's the sure. bare minimum. Have you found, um, at least in your observation, that this the, the high fat, low carb crowd, or particularly the keto crowd, and particularly the people on the keto crowd that get annoying? And I'm, I, I have been one of them. So yeah. I can say it with, pretty credi with some credibility. They tend to forget or maybe maybe a better way to frame this question is, is counting calories important if you're on a high fat, low carb, if you're in ketosis, any of that? No. So my, my personal opinion is that the whole counting calories methodology has been thrown out the window. And it's really not about the quality. It's about the, sorry, it's not about the quantity. It's, it's about, about the quality, quality of those calories. So 20 calories that come from sugar from like a candy bar versus 20 calories that come from, let's say, um, a piece of fruit right? Two different sources of sugar. Those are going to have two completely 
different metabolic responses on our body. Mm. So the, the fruit, right, it has fiber built into it. So that sugar will, and those calories will be extended throughout maybe a 30 or 40 minute window and it'll be more of an extended release. So our blood sugar levels will see a moderate bump and a moderate decline. Mm. And on the other hand, the calories that come from, let's say cane sugar, it's, it's gonna spike you and you're gonna be up and down. Your blood sugar is gonna spike really high. It's gonna go really low. Then it's gonna cause a craving to want more sugar. Right. So there's a completely different metabolic response mm. between calories. So you, that's that's the main thing people don't understand is that they, they just choose the low calorie option. Mm. But I encourage my clients to choose the, the, the quality of the calories over counting any any day of the week that's that's what I would suggest so mm. I, I personally haven't counted calories once in my life mm. I've done it a few times just to see what I eat on a daily basis just to have a baseline of just to know how much I burn just out of curiosity mm. but that's not part of the, the protocols that I that I help people work through right um, and I really believe that's an old methodology that people are starting to move on from, but a lot of people are still stuck in it. You'd be surprised how many people are stuck in it. Mm. So that's that's the main thing is that I try to educate people on is that there's completely different metabolic responses between eating, let's say a steak, and um, the same amount of calories in a, in a McDonald's burger, right? For sure. Um, so the steak that's grass fed, you know, it might boost testosterone, it might help you um, get into more of a ketogenic state and that, um, you know, that burger from McDonald's with the bread with all the highly processed oils in it is going to cause a completely different metabolic response, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to, it might cause some inflammation. Mm -hmm. So these are all the things that people have to look at. And it's not ever apples to apples when we're comparing calories. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very interesting. Very interesting. And on the, on the, on the end of the other, like the, the, the high fat, low carb, or for that matter, vegan, and I don't know if you can group them together in the same explanation, but what's your advice or i'm sure you know what's your what's your advice on, on 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 doing that how do you go about doing it correctly a high carb low fat or a high or like a plant based diet yeah so i mean i think the first thing to realize is that just because something is vegan doesn't mean it's healthier so the beyond meat burger for example if you look it up you'll see that the list of ingredients that go into it it's, it's about 20 ingredients half of them you can't pronounce half of them are these highly processed oils like soybean canola mm -hmm. and all these ingredients that are just synthetic and our body does not have any idea what to do with them a regular piece of meat that's grass-fed has one ingredient and that's just beef right mm. so um, just because something is vegan doesn't mean it's healthier so that's a trap a lot of people fall into mm. and then um, one thing I, I encourage people to do is, you know, if the average American person were just to completely cut meat out of their diet, they would be left with a really unhealthy diet because they most people, 60 percent of Americans get their calories from processed food, packaged mm. food. So if, if those people were to cut meat out, then they'd be left with just a bunch of processed food in their diet and very little plants. Um, so I believe that a plant based diet is is definitely the way to go. In general, people should just be eating more whole foods, things that come from the earth that either are living mm. or once were living. I think that's the key. If you follow that, you'll be healthy. Um, but when it comes to vegan, when it comes to um, choosing the kind of the things to add into your diet, whether it's whether it's meat, whether it's you're going uh, for a high carb or high fat diet, I think that's all individual and you have to kind of experiment with yourself. You have to become kind of your own doctor in some cases and just see what works for you, what makes you feel good. Right. And I think elimination diets are a great place to start where you eliminate all the inflammatory foods from your diet, which the most common inflammatory foods are dairy, gluten, sugar like you said and then corn and mm. grains so those mm. are those are the top and soy you can you can loop in there as well mm. so once people kind of set the baseline they get their body cleansed for a month then we can really go in and see okay which food groups can we start introducing back mm. and let's see how your body responds to those right so so having a structured way to do that i think is really important um and then whether you're choosing uh, you know meat or plant-based i think that's completely up to you and your goals i think both can be really healthy Mm. I don't think I don't think there's one answer. Mm. Um, I think if you're eating meat, you really, really have to educate yourself on where your meat is coming from. Mm. Is it organic? Is it grass fed? Is it wild caught? If it's not, you'd be shocked at the amount of pesticides, the amount antibiotics. of antibiotics and genetic, GMOs that are going All into your shit. food. Yeah. And unfortunately, we live in a place, the United States, where the, regula this the regulations is. are a lot worse here than they are in Europe. So, for example, uh, pesticides like glyphosate, which mm. is the main ingredient in Roundup, 
um, they are sprayed all over our crops. Those same herbicides are not allowed in Europe. Hmm. So the gluten containing products um, like the wheat in Europe is actually a lot safer for us to eat. So I don't know if you ever experienced the phenomenon of where you go to Europe and you have pasta. Like I've been to Italy, I've been to Greece and you know, I'll, I'll eat cheese, I'll eat pasta and I don't get the same bloating. Oh, I get the same thing in India, man. You'd yeah. be surprised. I don't, I don't have the indigestion that I get here when I eat it. And that's a part of it is because those animals are grass fed mm. and they're also not spraying with the same herbicides like Roundup that they do allow in the United States. And there's a huge difference between eating a grass fed, eating the dairy from a grass fed animal versus a non grass fed, a conventionally raised animal. Mm. And, and one of the biggest things you can take away is that the grass fed animals, their milk and their cheese, their byproducts have a lot less lactose in them. So grass fed mm. butter is almost completely lactose free. Mm. Um, so there are, there are ways to eat animal products and still avoid those common allergens, right? Mm. So lactose is what bothers most people. That's why, you know, lactose intolerant, two thirds of people have that now. And it's really common people are allergic to dairy. So that's why I think it's really important to understand that it's not just whether you're eating animal products, but it's like also you are what you eat ate. So you're not only what you are, the cow that you, that you're consuming, but what did that cow Ooh. eat? So you have to think about that next step down the ladder is what right. did that cow eat? So you are what you eat, ate. That hey. quote is always stuck with me. That's a solid ass quote. That's a yeah. good addition. Yeah. It's not what you eat. It's what you eat, ate. Yes. Fuck yeah. yeah. Okay. Very good. Yeah. And, and so, um, tell me about this elimination process, because I think it's, it, it should be seminal part of everybody's diet, right? Yeah. I have found it almost extremely difficult to have a static diet. So what I do is I I start with a few things and it will usually be rice for my carbs and and meat and some some vegetables and some fruits, right? And then whatever whatever doesn't work for me, I will move around. I will try and introduce eggs the next time. Or yeah. maybe like, you know, and this anti-inflammatory plus elimination concept is what I typically use. This yeah. cheese is not working for me, you know. Sure. I feel, um, what do you do you have something like that what's what's your suggestion what's your idea on 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 something like that so i think the low hanging fruit the easy stuff to start off with is just cut refined sugar out of your diet which Mm -hmm. is in most processed food Um, once i educate my clients on finding those sources then it's really easy from there Um, eliminating gluten for 99 percent of people has a lot of health benefits everyone is allergic to gluten whether you know it or not our bodies are not designed to process it it's a completely foreign protein Mm -hmm. that's what gluten is it's a protein and it's it's man-made man man manufactured so our bodies don't know what to do with it some people have different varying levels of allergies right so Mm -hmm. you might be intolerant like me or you might be celiacs on the other end or you might just feel a little bit of brain fog you know Mm -hmm. in the afternoon after you have this brain fog phenomena dude hyper interesting people totally. don't even realize yeah, totally. like, i did not realize until the brain fog went away how clear you, my mind can be yeah so i mean that's inflammation that's diet um so I, I really focus on the big sources and the other one i would add in there is dairy and i help people um find the sources of dairy in their diet and replace it with alternative plant-based sources so now there's so many um easy sources you can swap so there's coconut based yogurt there's almond based yogurt there's cashew cheese it's just not there's, the same there's coconut cheese there's coconut milk rather so I think if people are willing to experiment, um, there are a lot of really good substitutions. I think you'd be shocked if you tried some of the things that I've tried that are dairy substitutes. Like like for instance? um, Coco Yo, have you had it? No, I haven't. It's coconut based yogurt. It's filled with probiotics. It's the the macro ratios are awesome. It's clean. Mm. Um, I mean, I've gotten all my clients on this kind of stuff. Uh. So I think just opening your mind and trying, there's, there's hundreds of options at Whole Foods for for these plants. Oh, for sure. But the problem with Whole Foods is the paralysis that you have with so many sure, options. Sure. Like, what do I fucking even take home? Yeah, you know? yeah. No, there's there's an overwhelming amount now. And just because it's dairy free doesn't mean it's healthy. That's yes. the other thing too, is you gotta learn how to read these labels and they're hiding so much in these labels and they're putting all these claims in the front of the products now mm. that say dairy free, gluten free, um, keto, whatever you wanna call it, sugar free. But if you don't know how to read the back of a label, you're kind of you're kind of screwed because you're just you're just subjecting yourself to these claims they're making. And you're just buying into whatever the marketing. You're buying into advertising. Exactly. Right? So there's a simple rule with the labels. I don't I don't know if you prescribe that. If you can't pronounce what's written in the back of it, don't buy it. That is a hundred percent something I teach all my clients. Right? So I, I get into the nitty gritty of how to read labels, but that's a basic principle that if anyone takes away one thing from this conversation and it's for their overall health, if you can't pronounce the ingredients on the back of the label, don't, don't buy it. it. You shouldn't be eating. Fuck it. Yeah. yeah. Right. I agree. Um, and it's um, 
So what was I thinking? I think it skipped. I uh, part of my mind skipped skipped a beat there. But um, let me ask you about let me ask you about fasting as well because fasting is the new it yeah. in nutrition, right? Everybody's talking about how much they want to fast and how fasting helps and so on. What's your What's your take been on 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 fasting? What's a good window? What's What's the benefit? Yeah. So I mean, I think fasting has probably been the most remarkable thing that I've implemented into my health routine. I did it about a year ago. And since then, I've experimented with dozens of different types of fasts. Um, the benefits are unreal. I think it's the easiest hack that anyone can start tomorrow, right? It costs no money. It actually saves you money because you end up skipping a meal. Mm. It saves you time for prepping that meal. And the, the benefits are unbelievable, right? You, After the first couple of days, once you get over the hump of adjusting to your new eating schedule, which it only takes a couple of days, mm -hmm. just like your body adjusts to a new time zone when you fly to Europe, takes a couple of days to get over that jet, jet lag. It's the same thing with your metabolism. Um, so your body will quickly adjust. You'll start feeling more energy. So the, the real big benefit of fasting is that people used to think that constantly snacking all day was the way to go, right? It was it was uh, the best way to kind of keep your metabolism Yeah, six high. meals, eight meals six a day. Six meals mm -hmm. a day, that whole concept. So that's been thrown out the window and replaced with fasting. And the reason that's been thrown out the window is because that's constantly putting stress on your body. So if you actually realize how much energy it takes for your body to process food from your mouth to your stomach and, and excrete that food, it's actually remarkable. So to be constantly eating all day is just constantly putting stress on our body and not giving uh. our digestive system any break. Um, so by fasting, what you're doing is you're condensing the window that you're eating to maybe six hours a day or eight hours, depending on what you want to do um, and what your goals are. So what that allows your body to do is tap into fat stores for fuel. So you start burning fat more naturally. So obviously weight loss, who doesn't want to burn more fat while they're doing nothing? Mm. And then you start stimulating a process called autophagy. Have you heard of autophagy? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, this process where cells in your body start removing waste and they start exc excreting it. And they can't do that when you're digesting food because they're their priority is like, I got to get this food, turn this yep. into energy. ADP, yes. They don't have any time to kind of get rid of the waste. So when you fast and your your body is uh, running on ketones, when it's running on fat, you're actually stimulating this, uh, this autophagy process. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the huge benefits. And one of the best benefits of that is that you're supercharging your mitochondria, the little energies, little energy cells in our body, right? There's the energy billions. making parts of ourselves, They're, right? They mm -hmm. are, there's billions of them and they're, they're the powerhouse of all of our energy. Without them, we'd be dead in a matter of seconds. So mm -hmm. they're really important. And this is supercharging them by giving them a break and by allowing them to clean cellular waste and kill off dead cells. Mm. Um, so that's, that's one of the biggest benefits. The benefits that I see that are tangible in my life is um, with my clients, with, with my family, with myself, everyone that I've kind of helped approach, um, preach this methodology to is, is weight loss, mostly in fat. Um, a lot of people ask me, do you lose strength when you're fasting? Mm -hmm. I, I find that I haven't found a single case where you, where you lose strength. Towards the end of my fucking fast though, I'm a little like, I cannot work out sometimes, as intense. Sometimes, yeah. yeah. I, I think it's, it. it's different to each person for mm -hmm. sure. But I've, I've put on muscle while fasting. So that whole myth of you can't put on muscle while oh, fasting, sure. definitely, definitely not something I believe in. Um, I feel a lot more mental focus, especially when I wake up in the morning and I'm fasting until I eat my first meal, like until like 2 p.m. I'm just let's there, say. man, like a yeah. fucking animal. Right? I feel like an animal. But right? as soon as I eat, and no matter how healthy I'm eating, I find at least the first 20, 30 minutes to be a dip. Totally. And that's why I want to push off eating until I'm done with my day. That's totally. why I, I sort of, you know, push it to the corner. Sure. Where I'm like, if I eat, I'm going to want to do nothing. Yeah. Because I feel like such an animal yeah. when I'm not eating. So energy, mental clarity, um, fat loss. Um, and plus you just feel like this, this whole tightness in your digestive system, right? Yep. You feel the inflammation, you feel your body actually getting of the break that it's been wanting for years because most people are snacking all day, every day. Right. And that's just putting a lot of stress in our bodies and no one really knows it. But think about a couple hundred years ago, we didn't have refrigerators, so mm. we couldn't reach and grab, you know, a candy bar <laughs> yeah. or a glass of milk. I'm going to go hunt a wild boar because I feel like snacking. So we, our bodies are actually designed to go a couple days without eating, right? We'd kill something, kill an animal, oh, yeah. and now it would be feast or famine, right? We'd have a, a, a big meal, and then we, you know, have to wait till, till our next big kill or mm. till, till we harvested more fruits and vegetables. So our bodies are designed to go a couple days without eating, um, and to be eating all the time is just going against the way we're engineered. And think about the so many people um, 
focus on the aesthetic element of nutrition right yeah and no matter how in shape you might remain if your body is going to age if your cells are going to age you will lose the aesthetic appeal and i think ronda patrick study on 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 the autophagy the entire process of autophagy yeah. and how the way it yeah. works and i think don di agostino's work on yeah. the cancer element so ronda patrick anti aging there is so much that it blew my mind and yeah. particularly for women i mean women are so conscious of their aesthetic appeal uh, just adding fasting to it she says if you if you if what a 72 hour fast once a month and yeah. you are stopping the aging process by what 70 75% yes Crazy. Unreal, Crazy. and you know what? I've done a three-day fast, a three-day water fast. By the time it's two and a half, two, two, uh, one and a half to two days, you start feeling this amazing fucking yep. animal yep. fucking feeling, yep. right? Um, and for 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 people who are who live in places, say for instance, India, where where water and air quality is is of a toxic nature to some extent, dude. Fasting is going to be so beneficial to 100%. just killing the weak cells, autophagy, killing the weak cells that would eventually go on to make detoxify. Oh, massively, man! Yeah. With ketosis as well, initially, part of the reason why you hit the flu is because the weak cells die, and all the sh- or for that matter, your fat cells start burning, and all the shit that's stored in them for years starts circulating in your Which system. Which is where again. our body stores toxins is in our fat cells. Fat cells, right? Um, and 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 it, it's no doubt like fasting has been one of the most revolutionary, and it's mindless. I don't even have to think about doing yeah. it. Yeah. Right? It's the most low cost investment like you said into nutrition. Start a 16 hour fast. Yeah. S- tighten your eating window. Yeah, so so for your listeners who are like, okay, so how does it actually work? Mm-hmm. So I recommend if you've never done any fasting, start with a 12 hour fast. And what that means is that you'll pick a window of 12 so there's 24 hours in a day, so you'll pick a window oh, of 12 sure. hours where, when, when you can eat. Um so a typical person likes like maybe an 8 to 8, right? Mm-hmm. Because that's when people typically wake up. That's typically when they work when they finish work and they get home and have dinner. So 8 to 8 seems to work for everyone. That window can be customized to whatever you want as long as you're picking 12 hours to eat and before that 12 hours starts and after that 12 hours you're not having any calories. So anything over 50 calories will break your fast. Mm. Um so you can have coffee, you can have tea, um butter and coffee mct coffee all that what do you think about that no so that'll break your fast that because will? the butter is more than 50 calories that's going to break your fast but it still will keep you in a ketogenic state cuz uh-huh. it's all fat if that's the first thing so there are benefits to having that um but i i think that the key is keeping it under 50 calories in anything you're having outside of the window mm. and start with the 12 hour window that's easy anyone can do that right your body most people probably already you do probably that. already do that so do that for a week week 2 bump it up to 14 hours and eventually get to the point where you're doing 15 to 16 hour fast every day that's the sweet spot where you really see the most benefits when you see the autophagy stimulated at a high level and then on top of that i i only believe that you need to do that 5 days a week to get all the benefits so you can revert to your normal eating schedule on the weekends i still fast because i feel so good doing it there's mm. no reason for me to wake up and eat breakfast at 8 a.m. anymore mm. um so i think you know people um if you do it 5 days a week start at 12 hours of fasting have nothing but coffee water tea in your fasted state and then bump it up to 14 15 16 hours once you feel comfortable and i mean you're going to feel great within within the first couple of days of doing mm-hmm. that so that would be sort of the foundational advice that you would give people on nutrition you know yeah. start working with the lowest hanging fruit and that is you know fasting right yeah so yeah so i i really came across this interesting study through a podcast i was listening to and it was really the message i took away was it's really not about what you're eating it's about when you're eating so they did a study on thousands of mice right and they gave one test group uh, a mixed diet of protein fats and carbs they gave one high fat car a high fat diet the next group of mice was given a, a high carb diet so they tried all these different things and the last group they restricted the feeding window to 2 hours a day for these group for this group of mice they found that the high fat group the high carb group they all lived to be the same age and the ones that lived to be the longest by far was the group that had time restricted feeding to 2 hours a day that's fucking crazy so i've taken a lot of things away from a lot of these studies i've learned but one of the biggest is it's definitely important what you're eating but you, what, what people don't focus on is when you're eating mm. so learning to time those calories appropriately like how we were just saying carbs after a workout um following these little principles and learning to fast not only builds mental toughness and resilience and appreciation for your food mm. but your body like appreciates you for it even more right what's what would be the 
So you know what we we skip the pillars that you have, and yeah. I'm understanding one of them is nutrition, the yeah. other is movement, yeah. one is sleep, yeah, and then relationships, uh huh, spirituality, uh huh, and career, and career. What's wh- what is the lowest hanging fruit, or what is a digestible version of all these pillars? Like let's start with say um, stress and sleep. What's what's the lowest hanging fruit that one can do for for stress and sleep? So I think we definitely touched on diet. We touched on movement, which mm-hmm. is exercise. And then stress, um, I think stress is too, too pronged, right? So there's the physical stress, right? So people think of stress as like, oh, my job or my relationship or, um, you know, my finances. But there's also this second group of stress that most people have no idea exists, and that's environmental stress. Mm. So things like EMFs, electromagnetic frequencies that are emitted from our cell phones, our TVs, any Wi-Fi or Bluetooth device, those emit constant stress in our body. Our air quality in New York City is bad. Hmm. So that's another yeah, stress yeah, that we have. Sure. Um, water quality, a lot of people think tap water is fine and New York has the cleanest tap water. Well, if you actually look at the sanitation ratings, New York tap water is, is really not very well rated and maybe it is the best tap water, but it still is chlorine and fluoride. And, and if anyone is really educated on the consequences of having that every day, they wouldn't want it. So. Um, there's a lot of environmental stress and pollutants that are put on our bodies mm. um, living in these urban cities and, and just, you know, in the modern world. And that's one thing people neglect is those environmental stresses. I help people identify those and get those out of. How do out you of get the, water out of the way? How do you get tap water out of the way? <sighs> drink filtered water. I mean, a Brita is a good place to start, but I still think Brita doesn't filter out um, some of the things um, like like the fluoride. Uh-huh. In, in our water system so so um there's there's better uh reverse osmosis filters are definitely the best way to go very interesting i have some recommendations with specific brands i can i can share with you um afterwards and even yeah i'll you, put that give, in the show notes yeah give you, some, give you some links to some products that i recommend um and then how about the air air um get a hepa um, like an, like a an HEPA, air purifier hepa air purifier um and i think that's a good place to start and the emf um, EMFs are a little bit more complex to tackle, but I think the easiest thing that most people can start doing right away is put your phone on airplane mode when you go to bed. Don't sleep it on right next to your head. That's the worst thing you can do. For your sleep? Yeah, for your sleep. Interesting. Because the EMFs, so what they do is our body is naturally designed to process EMFs, right? EMFs come from the earth naturally. The earth mm. emits these electromagnetic frequencies. But the amount that we're exposed to on a daily basis now is way too much for our bodies to handle. Absolutely. So cell phones, um, computers, all that is contributing to that. And I think the key is learning how to minimize them when you can, because obviously we're not going to live in a cave. We're just, you know, we're beyond that point. Society's evolution. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So we can't do that. So I try to be realistic with my recommendations. One is turn your phone off at night. Just put on airplane mode. Your alarm is still going to work, but you're not going to be exposed to those EMFs. Another easy thing is keep your computer out of your bedroom, right? Um, Because a lot of people sleep with it in their room. It's actually emitting EMFs when when the laptop screen is closed. Mm. um, Because it's still receiving signals. So keep it out of your room and then keep your your router of your house, that's probably the biggest source of EMFs, at least 20 feet away from where you sleep. Mm -hmm. That's where you spend the majority of your time most likely. Mm. So the 20 foot rule is a good one to keep things 20 feet away if they're not powered off. And if it's next to you, make sure it is powered off or in airplane mode. So that is an easy way people can probably eliminate 50 60 70 percent of the emfs in their home environment Mm. Um, and then as far as the other stresses in life i i'm a big believer in finding a form of breath work or meditation that works for you practicing something like yoga um, incorporating that into your movement routine and into your overall stuff over overall lifestyle i think is key i think everyone should be doing that Um, i think breath is hands down the most powerful tool we have built into our body to manage stress and most people don't know how to breathe properly mm-hmm. i'm not a breathing expert but i've i've practiced probably 20 different types of meditation and breath work so I, I i at least have a good feel for what's out there and once you get in tune with how how your body breathes you can really control your emotions your stress levels you can bring yourself down in really high tense situations mm-hmm. and you can just channel a different energy that you're not able to naturally do mm-hmm. um, when you're when you're what's called chest breathing or shallow breathing which mm-hmm. is well, anyone who's having a panic attack is usually in that state of breath mm-hmm. and um, teaching people how to breathe um, a little bit more consciously is is something that i work on doing and i think that's a huge tool um for everyone that anyone could start doing is just download headspace right right start doing some guided meditations all you have to do is pop in headphones do it for 10 minutes when you wake up or before you go to bed 
and that's just an easy place for anyone to start and get in touch with like their body and their mind and how to learn how to kind of slow things down when you, when you want to. Because our minds are always racing and it's really hard to shut them off. Um, I think it's impossible, but learning just to take our attention off all the stress that's going on around us and bring it inside of us is a really, really powerful tool. No, that's, that, you know, um, in my in my battle against psychological, like, you know, my, my, whatever whatever little experiments I've ran on psychological well-being, I, I noted a very interesting phenomenon is that when shame would kick in very heavy, I would be afraid of breathing completely on the upside. And when fear would hit very heavy, I would be very afraid of breathing completely on the exit, right? Yeah. And so anytime I would have fear or shame, I would just make sure I'm breathing from a proper full exhale to a proper full inhale and the feeling sort of disappear. Yeah. And and that's the most miniature, the most low hanging fruit I prescribe in terms of breath. Whenever you find an overwhelming emotion and these tend to be the darkest of the two in my assessment, fear yeah. and shame, try just going back to your breath and letting it do its job in, in its completion and sort of you find the dissipation happening in, in terms of the emotion. Mm -hmm. um, as far as relationships are concerned, what do you what do you prescribe about relationships and spirituality? So um, I think the, the biggest thing to take away what I've learned from relationships is that if we look at the blue zones, right? Are you familiar with the blue zones? There's about seven of them and that's the places around the world where people have the longest life expectancy oh, yeah. mm -hmm. and they have the highest population of centenarians, which is people that live over a hundred years old. So there's one in Okinawa, Japan, there's Ikaria in Greece. Um, so there's a, there's a, there's about seven of them. And one of the things they've taken away from all of these blue zones is that people in these communities have strong relationships and a strong bond, right? A strong communal bond. So I think being a part of something, um, whether it's, it's a, it's a group that you're a part of, whether it's a team that you're a part of, I think that's a really important part of our overall health. Mm. Um, and we are meant, we are com communi communicative creatures by nature. So I think, having these relationships in our life is a really big part and i think the second piece to that is having meaningful relationships so i would much rather have two meaningful relationships than 50 shallow relationships in my life um and and there's a lot that goes into that but i, I really do believe that you are the, the sum of the people that you hang hang around the most right? right so the five people you hang out with the most you are the sum of those people mm -hmm. so i really believe in just surrounding yourself with people that you aspire to be or or push you in the direction of where you want to go yourself mm -hmm. um so so i think meaningful and intent having intention in your relationships is really important and, and thinking about you know the value that comes from relationships so you know um choosing your friends and investing your time with with intention i think is really important a lot of people just kind of bounce around from friend to friend and some of these relationships can be draining mm. so i think it's uh, one thing i encourage people to do is assess all the relationships they have in their life see which ones are bringing the most value which ones are not and seeing if they can you know shift that energy and focus that more into the ones that bring them value and happiness because a lot of relationships can be draining you know though that is a that is a very um there is a very notable paradox with respect to that. And you sort of referred to it when you spoke of joy and, and value separately. Mm -hmm. So a lot of uh, both these things are true. Let me set the case up uh, on one end. Any research ever, ever done on happiness has concluded that social relations tend to be the source of all happiness. I think that conclusion is slightly misworded because it's not the source of all happiness. It's the culmination of all happiness. And sure. what that means is you can go out and go win the world. But unless you have something to bring that back to later totally. tonight, it's not going to totally. work out. So you can be the champion of your arena, but it's it's worth nothing until you have somebody to share that with. Yeah. And that's sort of the, I don't know if I was speaking to you about it or somebody else, the lesson from the film Into the Wild, where once he dies towards the end, what he leaves behind is joy is meaningless if it is not shared. Yeah. And that's like, that's like this experiment in cinema right there. Totally. This guy who ran the extent of the experiment on isolation realized that it did not work, right? So that, that is what I call the relationships of joy. And then there's the relationships of value, the five people you surround yourself with, you know, your tribe becomes your vibe and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. What happens is people of our age, especially like mid twenties, early twenties, you know, even thirties, people are building themselves up for setting themselves up for a plateau in future in life. What they do is um, they focus too much on the relationship of value. And the, this relationships that are predicated on value often are not honest and complete enough. Mm -hmm. So what happens is that because there is so much engagement on this relationship of value, there isn't enough on the relationship yeah. of joy. And you either have to balance them out or fuse them. And that's what I tell my friends. I tell them, I have three different notions of people. One, people I can be friends with. Two, people I can work with. 
three people I'm friends with who I can work with. Yeah. Right. And it's the third one. If you can find that golden ratio, it's very difficult in yeah. my life. I realize every day, totally. all these people I counted on to be working with in the future totally. is going to be difficult. You don't want to fuck your personal and professional together. It's like shitting where you eat or eating where you shit. Don't do that. 100%. But um, figure out what works for you because your relationships are important for both propelling and stabilizing you. Mm-hmm. And it gives you meaning forward and meaning in the moment both. And 100%. you need to figure that balance out. Do you, is, is that make sense, right? Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, I think one thing to for people to do is realize which friend is good for which situation, right? Mm-hmm. Um, because you can have friends that are social friends. You can have friends that are, the, it's that one person you need to talk to when you're having a tough day. So I think um, realizing the situationality of it is really important. And then surrounding yourself with people that really care about you. Like I think when, when you're tested and you're in tough times is really when you see who your best friends are, who mm. the people that really care about you are. And I think, you know, that sometimes weeds out the the fake friends. Right. Um, but, you know, I, I think for everyone, focusing on deep relationships is a, is a huge thing. One thing that I really like to do with my closest friends is every, about once a year, I'll grab a dinner or go for a walk with them. And we'll just tell each other, you know, a couple of things that I admire about you and why I think you're so great as a person. And then a couple of things that I think you can improve on. Mm. And it's an open conversation. It's very stimulating. Very raw. And you, yeah, it's raw. You make yourself vulnerable, right? You open yourself up to critique. Mm-hmm. And um, I think it, it just it just keeps a, a really honest relationship. It strengthens the bond. Um, so I, I really encourage that. I also encourage instilling rituals in what you do oh for Um, sure i know like that's that's how we are developed as human beings is to be part of tribes and to have these rituals i think in modern society we we lack a lot of those and so whether it's a monthly dinner you get with someone um whether it's um grabbing coffee on a weekly basis i think instilling some sort of a ritual in your in your routine is really important and having um, kind of uh, a cadence brings people along too and it creates excitement around these things and it kind of keeps that bond open and strong in a lot of ways and mm. obviously I think when it comes to relationships the most important one you choose is right who you end up marrying mm. um, so I, I think that is a decision that people have to think through a lot and um, I've been lucky I found a really good partner shout um, out what's shout name? out Nic- to Nicole Nicole what's up um, yeah she's she's been great I've been dating her for about 10 months uh-huh. um, but she's been that person that's really propelled me into reaching success that I don't think I could have reached on my own mm. she pushes me in a lot of ways I think finding a partner that keeps you honest and keeps you motivated and kind of constantly challenges you in the right way I think mm-hmm. is is really good um, and just that person that supports you, you know, when you're having a tough day, when you're having a tough moment, that person that always brings you up, it's it's really hard to find that. So It's, it's realizing that there is a limitation to you. You know, very often, um, at least people like me, um, me for sure, I get so self-absorbed, I think I can take on the world by myself, but it's the, the constant reminder of how limited I am. Yeah. Uh, that's And, and how, how much I can extend myself through the means of the people around mm-hmm. me. It's beautiful. It's almost poetic to realize that. But, you know, um, here, is, here is one more piece of advice for anybody who's listening to this. Um, y- allowing yourself to be critiqued by your friends is one of the safest ways to ensure anti-fragility to negative feedback. You will get negative feedback anyway, no matter what you do. But we aren't strong enough for that because we fear we we might get stuck with that negativity and you might not be able to escape it. Allowing your friends to play that game with you slowly makes you realize you only get better with negative feedback. Yeah. Right? It's all in your... And here is the lowest hanging fruit when it comes to relationships. And I play this game very often, dude. When I'll be on like drives or whatnot, um, we're say... We'll be driving for a three hour distance and me and my friend or two hour distance or even an hour long. I'll be like, let's play a game. We all, we both of us get questions one after the other. We just have to answer them honestly. So I ask you a question, you answer it as honestly as you can. And I have made some of the most seminal friendships, some of the deepest fucking bonds with just this game. So I, I, you start off slow, you know, what's, what's one person in your family you cannot stand and why? And it'll sure. be, a, it'll be a funny response. My sure. father, my mother, blah, blah, blah. And then you slowly start digging in deeper from the answers you receive and you have to be patient. And you have to trade off your honesty in that process. And eventually what you find is you have such an incredibly irreversible bond because you shared the most vulnerable. You know, the easiest way to make friends and social connections that last is to fight a common enemy. That's an evolutionary hack as well. And uh, one of the funniest presentations of that to me was was Vipassana because 10 days after we, I was looking at all these people meditate with me, never talking, never making eye contact. As soon as we were done, we were best friends. And it made no sense. Yeah. And the reason was we were fighting this imaginary common enemy, which is the other half of our psyche. Yeah. Everything that disturbs us, 
find a common enemy and i i don't mean go around bitching about people because that has psychological consequences of its own sure, yeah. but think of one thing in you and them that you want to tackle together and that's why gym buddies become such good friends because we are tackling yeah. fit, fitness True, in some yeah. sense right so find that and that that tends to be the easiest hack around building relationships and building meaningful relationships honesty is key not just and you are not just being honest with say i'm not being honest with you i'm being honest with me on some level i am mm-hmm. processing the the unconscious parts of my psyche from a psychoanalytical standpoint and i'm letting them integrate into the narrative of me which is one of the highest correlation uh, highest correlations with well being is the consistency of your narrative is the processing of your experience in a singular line yeah. right um I mean we've been we've been going at it for an hour and a half. Do you want to tell people where they want to find you, where they can find you online? Yeah. Of course. Yeah. So, uh best place to find me is on Instagram at the living fuel, T H E living fuel, all one word. Um my website is thelivingfuel.com. Um that's the easiest place to find me, learn about a little bit more about what I'm doing. Um feel free to DM me if you're interested in working with me or just shoot me an email at manoli at the living fuel m a n o l i at the living fuel.com shoot me an email if you're interested in working with me hearing about the programs that I've helped people with and um I really appreciate you having me on No so, no no man I think uh for anybody who might might who's interested in Manoli's work his uh, his website has some dope articles on supplementation sleep and stresses and what not um I really enjoyed going through all of that thank man. you stuff on L theanine something that's so accessible to people like yes. matcha fucking tea all of those yes. things people don't realize yeah. um even um even tyrosine and nac and what not is just basic supplements we yeah. can add in our systems that just do so much man uh what's the one that i use i'm forgetting uh, with nac what's glutathione yeah. right resveratrol yeah. all the yes. stuff um and please hit him up i've 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 learned so much from him man thank you so much for course, doing this man this has been so much yeah. fun yeah thank you did you realize it'd been an hour and a half no i had no idea right that's the fun part of doing this is when <laughs> you just do not realize we can pause this was this supposed to be playing yeah was it not uh,